Good afternoon and welcome to the Soil Making It Work or Where Does It Go webinar. This webinar is presented by the Bay of Quinney Remedial Action Plan. Currently, our focus is the reduction of phosphorus loads to the Bay of Quinty to ensure continued improvements in water quality. Our presenters today are Patrick Lynch, who is a certified crop advisor in Ontario for Ontario farmers, both conventional and organic. He's an entrepreneur who started a crop consulting venture for Cargill, which became the largest crop consulting business in Canada. He's a renowned speaker addressing a variety of agricultural topics. As well, he is well known for his column in Better Farming and is currently co-authoring a weekly crop production newsletter. Our next presenter is Jeff Meyer. He is a geomatics professional who specializes in observ observational data collection and visualization. Currently, Jeff works for Lower Trent Conservation. He will discuss new ways of measuring and visualizing patterns of soil erosion and deposition on fields. Finally, Jason Jobin is a stewardship technician with the Bay of Quinney Remedial Action Plan. He will outline their current stewardship programs, which help farmers implement best management practices to keep soil on fields and reduce phosphorus loads to local waterways and the Bay of Quinty. Thank you for attending today's webinar and I will turn the presentation over to Patrick. Patrick, you're up. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, this is certainly a different way for me to be presenting, and I'm trusting, Sarah, that if you can't hear me at any time that you will phone me or somehow let me know. So what I want to talk about is forages, rotations, tillages, and I really want to talk about have getting more acres into forages in this area, but also want to talk about getting more forages per acre. So here's the summary, and I know it could be, uh, you know, I've taken a chance not being able to look you people in the eye to see who's listening or not, but in case some of you nod off, here's a summary of my presentation. I want more people to plant more acres to forages. And I want increased forage yields per acre. And the idea is that if you get more per acre, then you're going to end up harvesting fewer acres per year. And harvesting costs are one of the biggest costs of forage production. With that, so you're going to have more acres and forages and a higher yield, but really you're going to end up harvesting fewer acres. So that means you get a chance to set aside some of that poor yielding of fragile line. And then as I drive around the country, I, I did spend a bunch of time in Western Ontario. Now I'm here in Central Ontario. Um, I think still maybe a little bit too much tillage going on. So I want to encourage use of conservation tillage or no-till corn into alfalfa. And as the newscaster says, those are the headlines and now for the story behind the headlines. So some of the things, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you've heard it so many times, you know it, but consider this a refresher. Forages build soil health. And part of it's intuitive, like everybody knows this, that there is increased yield of the following crops. We know forages build organic matter. We know that they reduce erosion. And you're going to see some presentations later on, on erosion, how to measure it. But from my experience, forages reduce erosion and increase soil health, which is a little bit harder to measure. So you're just going to have to take my word for it. The problem with forages, and there's no ads promoting forages. Like you're not going to pick up the Better farming or Ontario farmer and say, you know, my forage yields out yields your forage yields, or the next time you go into the field with your combine, you know, into the forage field, use this. There's no ads with with forages in the background. So really nobody is promoting the use of forages. And as a result, the yield of forages over the last 30 years has stayed the same. Corn yields have gone up, wheat yields have gone up, soybean yields have gone up, 
Forage yields have stayed the same. If you look at the OMAFRA statistics, they've even gone down in the last 10 years. Okay, I said forages build soil health, and sometimes I get a little bit uh, annoyed with people talking about soil health. And, and the, the reality is soil health is so hard to measure. And I spend a lot of time looking for research in North America, and there's really very little research on, on showing the benefits of forages and soil health. And <clears throat> one of the methods that are used is to measure soil organic carbon. Now this is different than soil organic matter. So this is a respected, tried, proven, peer-reviewed system to take a look at who's building soil health, what's it doing. So they're going to measure soil organic carbon. And luckily, there was research started at University of Guelph over 40 years ago by Dr. Terry Danner. And then uh, Dr. Tony Vine, who is now at Purdue, carried on. Then Dr. Bill Dean, and Bill Dean retired this past year. And now it's being carried on by David Hooker. But this is 40 years of rotational work, and it's in Ontario soils. And, and uh, the soils at, at Alora, they are, they are unique, but they are also representative of much of Ontario. So now just bear with me. With soil organic carbon, there's, there's a number of ways of doing it. One way is to take a look at the soil organic carbon in the top 20 centimeters of soil. And what they've done, they've got continuous corn, 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 soybeans, corn, corn, soybeans, wheat, corn, corn, soybeans, wheat with red clover, corn, corn, alfalfa, and just alfalfa. And in the top 20 centimeters, you can see that rotations with alfalfa in it, there is more soil organic carbon. So first point, if you're looking at soil health, get the alfalfa in. The other way of looking at soil organic carbon is to take a look at a set mass rather than the depth, but just take a, the set mass or weight of a certain amount of soil. And when you take a look at that, now the forages are really starting to shine above the rest of them. Notice down here, corn, corn, soybeans, soybeans, that's the worst, and I think from everything I read, if you had soybean, soybean, soybeans, it's probably going to be down here somewhere. But back when this research was started, nobody would even anticipate that we'd be growing three years of soybeans out of five on, on land. So the bottom line is forages prove soil health. Now, the rotational value of forages. I've talked to, to many farmers and renters will pay more for land coming out of forages. In some cases, 30% more, but it does vary by crop. Edible beans, they pay more. I spent a little time working with some of the um, farmers in the Maritime and PEI, they'll pay a lot more uh, to grow potatoes if the crop the previous year was forages. If renters are willing to pay more for forages, that means that every forage acre that you grow is of more value to you. So think about it. Renters are willing to pay more. You get to use yourself. It's worth more to you. Other values of the forages. Reduces weed pressure. Weed seeds germinate and die. And I've seen this so many times. I've, I've worked as a crop consultant for 25 years and scouting fields, making crop plans. And typically, if a farmer had a field on forages for three years and we put in a corn, we didn't have to worry about foxtail or other annual grasses because any of the annual grasses that were in that soil, the seeds germinated and died. So we would just have to put together a little inexpensive broadleaf control program. <clears throat> perennials crowd out or, or forages crowd out perennials like sow thistle and milkweed. Um, great way to control these. Um, perennial perennial weeds is with forages. And we know that we can reduce the seed bank of glyphosate resistant flea bane. We got so much glyphosate resistant flea bane around, it's, uh, it's a little bit embarrassing. <clears throat> the cash croppers know the rotational value of forages, but they also get the nitrogen credit. And the nitrogen credit is something that is uh, 
not utilized by way too many farmers. Okay, so I want to talk to you a bit about hay as a cash crop. In this area, three to four of the last 10 years is a 4-H shortage. And you know what? I don't think this is going to change. The weather that we get in this area is uh, really not conducive to getting high forage yields every year. So there is an opportunity as a cash crop. But I'm not too sure about growing it on speculation. You need storage and that storage could be plastic. But if you are growing it on speculation, you, you need storage. And anybody who had forage to sell the last three years knew that you could go a couple more years without making anything just on the profit of them. <clears throat> Typically though, it's better to get a commitment before you harvest. And I have worked with, with cash croppers and I know of other farmers that are doing the same thing. They know a dairy farmer in their area and they make a commitment. Uh, the dairy farmer makes a commitment. The cash cropper makes a commitment to grow and harvest forages. There is a market for dairy cattle and in my vision, this is going to expand. You know, you read everything about what's going on in the dairy industry, but in my vision, we will need more dairy products in the future. And, and some of these dairy guys, you know, they make money in the barn. They really don't want to be wasting time, um, you know, growing forages. So there is an opportunity. Marketing to the U.S. has been an opportunity right now. Who knows? And one of the markets that was in Western Ontario, and I really haven't seen much here in Central Ontario, is the fishworm market. The Lumbricus terrestris or the fishworms that are in Ontario are very unique to to the world they grow bigger here and i don't know why but there is a big market in western ontario the fish worm pickers come in and if anybody's ever seen them you you'll know what the heck is that but you'll be driving out at midnight and you see a whole bunch of lights in a, in a big field of forages what is going on they're not they're not fireflies then you get a little bit closer they are people out there with headlights on and they're picking fish worms and let me tell you the fish worm market is a big market. Like we're talking $300 an acre plus for the right to, to pick fish worms. So there, there are many opportunities for forages. Now, the one that I want, I want to talk about a little bit is the nitrogen. And farmers do not give alfalfa credit. At least a lot of them don't. And I put a value of 55 cents a pound on nitrogen. Just taking a sip of water. <clears throat> so at 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre, that's $55 an acre. But if you're going to give a credit, you got to believe it's there. And that means you got to have a uniform stand. Too many farmers I talked to, well, how good was the, well, not bad. Okay, we should give it some credit. No, I don't think so. I don't want to. Why not? Well, I never did. That's not good enough reason for 50 bucks an acre. Now, if you got some thin spots, you know where those thin spots are, so you can touch them up with manure, and, and now you've got equal nitrogen across it. So I said that forages add yield to the falling crop. How much? We don't really know. Why not? Well, because there's the nitrogen credit. So if you do corn after corn beside corn after alfalfa, how much of that yield increase is due to just the fact that it's alfalfa and how much is it due to the fact that there's nitrogen there? But the very conservative estimates from research trials is corn yields will be increased by eight to 10% when it follows alfalfa the first year. And in the second year, it continues another 68% in the second year of alfalfa. Now I'm using corn as the crop, but other crops are going to yield the same or, or have the same type. So if you have corn after alfalfa and then soybeans after that, there is a yield increase to those soybeans. The alfalfa roots add nitrogen. They break up compaction and they slowly decompose. And that's what we want, that's what we need uh, to put life into the soil. You know, you have soybean roots or even corn roots. They go into the soil, but they break down right away and they're not much value. The alfalfa roots, they are perennial. So they're there and they're going to break down over time. They're not all going to be gone the first year. They'll be there the second year and third year. And as they break down, they leave those channels 
in the soil. Like you need those channels for air and water. They're breaking down over time and that's what you want. It is the best way to reduce compaction. Now, as I drive around the country, I see too many fields like this. Like this, this is an alfalfa field, a forage field. There's some alfalfa there, but it should have been terminated. A, a good uh, way to decide if your alfalfa should be terminated or not is if there's lots of dandelions. So when you see a nice yellow alfalfa field like this, you know that it's past its best before date. This is when you terminate alfalfa. When you have a really good stand, and these are the stands, this is the time when you should be terminating them. Nitrogen credit, just something else on the nitrogen. This nitrogen is slow release, and there's a lot of talk about slow release nitrogen and, and how you should be doing it using Y drops to get in there late in the season. The alfalfa nitrogen is slow release, and there is, as I said before, credit on into the second year. <coughs> so, Here's something else, and, and I can't see you, but I have fun with dairy farmers when I'm speaking to them in a group and I can see their faces, but older stands yield less. And this is a summary of research from Wisconsin, Dr. Dan Undersander, but you could go anywhere and see it. You know, first year, not much. Then the yield's up there. The longer the alfalfa is in the stand, the lower the yield gets. And in research plots, there is a 15% less yield by the third year, 30% less by the fourth year. Now this is in research plots where there's no heavy equipment. If you were to go into these fields with heavy equipment, I'm sure the yield loss is more than that. Um, Patrick, yes. I had a question for you. Yep. Um, what, what do you think is a realistic yield goal for forages in our area here? Okay, th that's an excellent question. Thanks very much. And if anybody else has questions to add them in. Okay, so realistically, we gotta be shooting for five tons of dry matter to the acre. The provincial average has got us in around eh, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, .5, half of that. Um, and, you know, we can see uh, DLF pick seed, they do research in Ontario there, and, and they got yield of their variety. So five tons of dry matter is realistic. We are not coming anywhere close to that. Uh, and again, thanks for the question. Anybody else get question? Stop me, we'll handle them as we go. <laughs> so here's a whole bunch of numbers, so just bear with me. And what I've done is I've taken uh, a farmer needed 600 tons. And he could have either died up with seeding year, four years of alfalfa, seeding year, three years of alfalfa, seeding year, and two years of alfalfa. And so the acres he would need it, seeding year only 97, seeding four 104. Now I have since got newer information and these numbers are very, very conservative. You would need many more acres than that in the fourth year, less in the second year. But even with these numbers, so I've given a nitrogen credit. You know, if you leave it down there, it's maybe $25 worth, $100 if it's only down for two years, the nitrogen value, the free land value, because over here, you're not using as many acres, so you can do something with those other acres. <coughs> and here's the rotation credit. The amount of extra yield because you got forages in there. So the value of a shorter rotation, seeding year plus four is the check, there's nothing to it. The, the shorter the stand, the greater the value of each acre. So if you leave alfalfa down for three years, the gain is $150 per acre in increased value from the following crops. Leave the stand down for seeding plus two years, that's 220. Now, those numbers seem like, holy macro, that can't be. Well, I challenged anybody to go through these numbers and come up with a different number. And even if you don't believe my 150 and 220, um, it's a lot. And it's the value of the succeeding crops that is the big thing in forages. And this comes back to my thing. Uh, I want more acres and forage 
but not the same acre. I want that, those acres to be moved around. So the next thing is, I want higher yields. And how do you get more forages per acre? It's simple. And we have some farmers doing that, but not near enough. Um, four times a forage moves 56 pounds of phosphorus, 200 to 250 pounds of potash. So that yearly means 100 pounds of map, 330 to 400 pounds of potash. And when I ask farmers in a group, how many of you are putting that on? A bunch of hands get up and I look them in the eye and say, really? I don't think they are. We're not, we're not fertilizing forages. And I, I have two brother-in-laws that sort of fall in this category. And I, I tell them, listen, if you'd managed the alfalfa you got a little bit better, you wouldn't be running all around the country and ruining the equipment and chasing up and down hills to get more forages. Just put in less acres and do a better job of them. Now, the other thing in this part of the province is we need sulfur. <clears throat> and my wife is really not a crops person, but we'll be driving around the spring night. Patrick, is that sulfur deficiency over there in that alfalfa field? Uh, yes, Sandra, it is. And she can pick it out, you know, as we're driving along the road. Magnesium, in this area of the province, there's a lot of fields that really need magnesium. But, you know, whether you need it or not, and the rate depends on the soil test. And in one of the programs that the, the hosts are, are doing today, they are offering uh, compensation for farmers that, that do do soil tests so you know where we are. And the other thing to get high yield is putting on ammonium sulfate in the spring. That gives it a shot of nitrogen plus getting that sulfur on there. So that's how you get more forages. In this area, leaf hoppers. You know, two out of the last three years has been terrible leaf hopper. And years and years and years ago when I worked as a soils and crop specialist, I remember coming down into this area and Bill Hurst was the soil and crop specialist. And we could see leaf hoppers so bad in this area, certainly worse than in Western Ontario. <clears throat> on lighter soil, you gotta apply boron. It's not, you know, hum, it, it's just not open for debate. You just gotta get that boron on the lighter soils. And the other thing to get more forages per acre, terminate the stand, don't let it die. And I have fun with the dairy guys because when I get in a group with dairy, I poke fun at them, they poke fun at me and we get back and, and I say, how old is your stand? Oh, wow, you know, we got some four, five, six year old. I said, oh, that's great. And you got some 12 and 15 year old cows still milking? Well, no, we know that the old cows don't produce. What's well, the same with the alfalfa? Old stands don't produce. Get rid of them. So don't leave your forages down so long. Manage forages for high yields. And then you reduce the acres harvested. And this reduced harvesting cost, probably the biggest, the biggest cost in forage production is harvesting cost. I, you know, to take it to the, to get it off the field and, and get it to the barn. After that, there are different costs, but harvesting costs is huge. And if you can harvest fewer acres and get the same amount off, you're gonna be money ahead. In this area, as I drive around, you know, I can't see, never come across a farmer that I could not easily reduce his harvest's acres by 10% and other, other farmers probably 20, 25% if they just manage the other ones better. So why do farmers leave forages down so long? Stones, well, <clears throat> that's a hard one to get across. Yeah, you know, picking stones, that's not easy. You like to, but that's, you know, that's really not big enough reason not to have a short rotation. The other one is, well, look, seed costs too much. The seed does not cost too much. Come on guys, give me a break. How much did you pay for corn seed? I'm just working with a farmer here now and $260 a bag for 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 80,000 kernels. So that's over $3,000 a thousand and 31. He's close to $100 an acre for seed. Now soybean seed is not quite as much, but forages, how much are you going to pay for forage seed? 100 bucks an acre over three years? It's a third of the cost of corn seed. Forage seed is not expensive. 
you know, per acre, per crop, per ton of feed, it's the best buy out there. So the cost of forage seed is not a reason not to seed more acres in the forage. Okay. So, and again, any questions, I'm going to sort of change subject. I, I would love to take them. And nobody's got any more questions there. Um, I'm not uh, uh, seeing too many. Um, and just a reminder, there is a Q&A function um, in, in the uh, program and to use that. Um, so we'll see. Um, uh, what do you, I do have a question. Um, do you, what would be the most limiting factor in forage production in this area in your mind? Okay, so that's a farmer who's been around or thinking a lot. You know what? The most challenging or the, the, the biggest limiting factor in forage production in this area is in the farmer's minds. They are not putting the priorities in the right place. You know, if I get weeds in the cord, well, I put together a program with some weeds there, I get in trouble. And if the weeds don't get sprayed in time in the cornfield, I can give the farmer a hard time. But forages, well, you know, we'll spray them. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. We'll see how it goes and I'll get around us sometime. Fertilizer, yeah, I've got to get all the fertilizer in the corn. What about the for? Well, I put manure in the forages. That's not enough. So the biggest thing, the biggest challenge in forage production is mindset, changing it. Seed is not cheap. You need fertilizer. You, you, you manage corn and soybeans to get the most. You got to do the same with forages. It's fairly simple. And, and every farm is unique. Every farmer is unique, but everyone can get more forages per acre. I, you know, I worked with one grower for the first time this past spring and he called me and said, Patrick, I'm just not satisfied with my forage yields. I know it should be better. Well, we took a look at the soil test. His magnesium levels were so low that, you know, it was fairly simple and, and he wasn't putting on sulfur. So he put on sulfur and magnesium. Now he had different weather this year, but great yields this year. Now he's no longer buying and he called me up at the end of the year, Patrick, you know that stand, uh, it's really good. I, I'm thinking about taking another cut off it. Do you need it? No. Well, then leave it alone. It's great. You know, leave it alone. So it's mindset. We can do much better. So okay, we, oh, I was going to say we've got another question. Okay, go ahead, Ed. Or if you have more to add on that one. That's, nope. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, what forage seed mix do you recommend? Ah, uh, <laughs> I was afraid that would come. You know what? I work with individual farmers and uh, I, I have different mixes for different people. We have one guy, he's got bed straw so bad that, you know, it, it's an embarrassment. So he's got to go to Harv Extra. He's got to go to a Roundup Ready Alfalfa. I have some guys that, you know, Patrick, your alfalfa is great, but this land is never going to grow alfalfa. It's got to grow grass. Okay, so we'll put those fields into grass. Um, and I'm thinking of another customer, you know, and he's saying, my yields are no good. Well, what's your potash level? Well, they're low. Well, why don't you put any on? I don't want high potash in my feed. I said, okay. So every farmer is different. I, you know, the, the new festoleums, they're interesting. I haven't figured them out. For those of you who may or may not know, festoleums are a new brand of grasses. They are, um, they are a cross between rye grass and fescue. So there's perennial rye, there's annual rye, there's meadow fescue, tall fescues. So the festoleums are, are a nice way. So my my basic is an 80% alfalfa, 10, 20% of, of a grass. And I try to encourage farmers to try new grasses, but I will, uh, I will change my mix and blend depending on the farmer and the field of what they're going to do. So the dairy guy is obviously different than the beef guys. Okay. Uh, that's 25 minutes, got 15 minutes. Okay, we're good. So Anne or Sarah, any more questions, just stop me at any time. 
The next thing I want to do is talk about cover crop forages and talking to Jeff and and really Jason. Uh, we had a discussion before the meeting on cover crops and I'm Jason. I'm so pleased that your conservation authority is allowing uh, or, or you know you you encourage farmers to do cover crops and they can decide which cover crop. Now one of the simplest cover crops is red clover and winter wheat. So to me every field is in winter wheat should have red or red clover in it. One of the other simplest ones is oats after winter wheat if you didn't get the red clover in. Uh, and then you know I have to take the spring grade or early off then oats and cereal rye. <coughs> now this is uh, this is my son, oldest son, his three daughters. You can't see the youngest one, but she's right up the front. But they are <coughs> uh, four wheeling through his father-in-law's red clover field. And that's just a beautiful field of red clover. You know, nothing, nothing exciting, nothing. He went in. I thought everybody knew this, but he said, I, I didn't know this, I should have done. After the wheat came off, he went in, clipped everything, and beautiful stand of red clover. And this is, is another farmer that I work with, and uh, we, we have a new weekly newsletter, and we're saying, okay, once that cover crop gets out there, you got to get the fungicides on it. And two of our customers on the newsletter said, you know, you convinced me, so I went out and tried it. And one of them said, you know, my son couldn't believe the difference. We left some on spray. And and this farmer, he said, I can't believe it. You know, when I put that fungicide on, I missed a little area. The difference by putting a fungicide on the oats and, and P-Mix was just phenomenal. So if you're going to grow cover crop for forages, uh, you got to treat it like a crop. Make sure you got some nitrogen on there. If it's a P-Oats and put a fungicide on there. And again, you know, you manage a cover crop, and I'm sort of changing my opinion on this. I said before, you know, if you're not going to sell the cover crop, yeah, you know, I don't care if you put fertilizer on or not. I'm going to take it afterwards. Actually, the farmer challenged me. Well, Patrick, he said, if I want more cover crop to sell for feed, you tell me to manage it, but I want cover crop to improve the soil. So why wouldn't I want to get as much cover crop as I as I need it? And if I can put on a little bit of fertilizer, a little bit of fungicide and get more cover crop, why wouldn't I do that? I said, you're absolutely right. I'm going to change my mind from now on. You know, if you're growing a cover crop as a cover crop, manage the darn thing. This now this this gentleman, this farmer is in an area where he, he got <laughs> he got a big buck for this feed, but uh, because the livestock in this area, but think about applying that down if if he hadn't sold it. So <clears throat> if you get more acres and forages and more forage per acre, you're going to free up some acres. And what you're going to do is take less productive land. Out of, now I'm going to do something which works in a live presentation. I'm not sure if it's going to work here. I'm going to try it anyways. I'm going to take 12 seconds and I got my time one. Think of your own farm and some land that's really not that productive. OK, think about it. OK, now if you did that exercise, you have come up in your mind with some land that is really not that productive. You know that when you plant corn or beans or other stuff there, you're not getting your inputs back. So take that land out of production. And then there's different things you can do it. You can establish permanent grass areas or plant trees. Um, I if if anybody has a chance or if you got time, uh, go on to Canada's Outdoor Farm Show site and listen to the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, uh, the presentation they made there. <clears throat> and they are in the wood lot that's at Canada's Outdoor Farm Show. And it was planted there 24 years ago. You should see the size of those trees, especially the oak. Like, I, 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 it's hard to believe that that's how big they got on 24 years. but 
you know, it's good land and they did manage them, but it, it shows you what's possible. And some of this land that's not making you any money, you know, you can plant trees there. Like some of this land should never been taken out of trees. Just put that land back into trees or a permanent grass cover. Now, one of the grasses I like is switchgrass. And <clears throat> switchgrass, you know, the beauty of it is you cut, cut it and swath it in the fall after frost, October, November, and then you don't bale it till the next spring. Seems weird, but that's the way it's done. And switchgrass, when there was a feed shortage, switchgrass was being sold, especially to the dairy guys for their TMRs. Switchgrass also makes good bedding. But if, if you had land and put it in switchgrass, just let the darn stuff grow. And if a year when things get, get uh, you know, a little bit tight forage-wise, you got something that you can harvest and sell. Take the fragile land out of production. And everybody knows what this is. This is land that's along open water, whether it's a drainage ditch or another course. Take that land out of production. Uh, you know that in the future, you're not going to be able to farm it anyway, so you might as well start thinking about it now. Um, and some of that land along the open water, it shouldn't be. I, I, I get a little bit concerned sometimes when I drive around and see somebody working the field right up to the edge of water. Some of that fragile line, take it out, use it as a, as a, a laneway or a pathway or whatever, um, and, and now you can do it. The other thing that you could do with bulks of land, and I've seen a wee little bit of this done and wish more. Some of this land that's really no good for up, just establish a wildlife or a pollinator habitat. Um, now, I'm also a hunter, so you know there is opportunities there uh, if you're a hunter to establish your own habitat that way, but I won't go any further there. Okay, so that's about uh, 32 minutes. So I'm going to switch to tillage briefly, unless there's any questions on forages or growing forages or cover crops as forages. Uh, Sarah or Ann, any other questions there? Ann, are you there? Um, yeah, yeah, one uh, question. Um, do you think we should be going to two or three cuts? Um, Good question. OK, so the traditional has been three cuts, but the reality is, you know, you go to three cut system and you're going to get some high quality feed and you're going to get feed. You don't need that high quality all the time. So if you have fields or if you have livestock that don't need that high quality, you will get you know, as much or more yield per acre and definitely a lot less harvesting costs if you go to a two system. Now, one of the um, things I didn't talk about was the Harvextra alfalfa. And the Harvextra are, are, you know, they don't want us to call it Roundup Ready Alfalfa, but it's the alfalfa that's resistant to Roundup is that it doesn't lose its quality of feed so that you can leave it out longer. So, you know, if you're into that type of system, then probably a two to three as opposed to three to four. So that type of system, you could reduce one of your cuts just by going that way. <coughs> so next thing, again, if any more questions, don't hesitate to pop them up. The uh, <coughs> next thing that I want, oh, 30, I'm 35, I only got five minutes left. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about, I say a little bit about tillage, but tillage is very personable and, and you know, the tillage for one farm is not going to fit one a next farm and the tillage for one farmer won't fit another one. So <clears throat> this was a picture I took last year and if somebody recognizes theirs, well, um, you can get back at me, but this land has got, as you can see, a bit of a slope to it, and it's been moldboard plowed. In the center part of it, I believe, was an older stand, so it's going to be left, and that's certainly going to, you know, reduce the amount of erosion coming down here. So on this field, the pluses, I didn't think that was the right way to spell it, but I googled it, and that is. So on this piece of land, the pluses are that it is in alfalfa, and alfalfa does 
reduce erosion. And some of the field is left so that the erosion coming down here is going to stop. But some of this now this is just going to go into the bush, which is, you know, that's life. The minus it's sloping land. Uh, another minus is here you can see subsoil being brought up and you, you can't farm subsoil. There will be erosion. There is an extra cost to doing this and a field like this. You know, you can go in there and no-till corn. I was part of the team that 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 started no-till in Ontario. One of the first things I still remember it <clears throat> was a dairy farm, took the first cut off, went in and planted corn just with a regular John Deere corn planter. It was a beautiful stand. So no-tilling corn in the alfalfa field, that's about as simple as I get. And, and so a field like this, no reason why you need any tillage. You just go in there and plant corn. And I guess the next thing is, as I drive around, I see quite a bit of tillage on these cover crops. Um, and we did a demonstration at Canada's Outdoor Farm Show. Um, we had 20 different pieces of, of equipment there doing tillage. And other than a couple with deep shanks that were going way down, every one of them did a good job. And, and in this demonstration, you know, I. I I got slides, but I'm not here. Each one of these pieces of equipment did a good job in terms of incorporating some of that residue, uh, leveling the ground off, preparing a seed bed, doing all the things that you need to do uh, with with tillage. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I've had some very heated discussion with some farmers who are hardcore no-tillers. Well, no, I don't have to no-till. Well, you have to work in the mirror. No, I don't have to. Well, yes, you do. Those are the rules of the game. You put manure on, other than a forage crop, you have to work it in. And and the other one is with lime. If you need lime, you've got to work it in. So you don't have to work the field every year, but, but you can be working it. But if you're growing a cover crop, there is no reason to be moldboard plowing it. And I see you've only got a couple minutes done. Uh, here, I ask farmers, you know, um, a budget thing on tillage. And they say, well, what's the best thing? Well, it depends. For corn stalks, was a stock chopper used? <coughs> and if a stock, chop, stock chopper was used, then you really got to do some tillage. Otherwise, you're going to have such a thick mat of stuff there. Now, depending on how heavy the soil is, you could do it in the spring or in the fall. This time of year, as it's getting kind of wet, it's, you know, some of this heavier land really shouldn't be doing any type of this conservation tillage. <clears throat> so the other question asked, so why, why is tillage being done? The landlord wants it plowed. Jeepers, you know, I, I can't get around that one. You know, I'd like to talk to the landlord, but that's not an option. The farmer wants to see black soil. Well, you know, <clears throat> again, that's that's really not making anybody any money. And the other one was, well, if I plow, I would plow deeper, I can make topsoil. No, you can't. You plow deep, like I see driving around the country, you're bringing up subsoil. Fertilizer salespeople love to see that subsoil coming up because then they know that the, you know, the fertility has been lowered and you're going to need more fertilizer. So every time you see uh, subsoil coming up, just think, OK, going to need more fertilizer there. <clears throat> but but what we're trying to do with this tillage is uh, with corn stalks is we're trying to cut it up and and size the residue so that we can work it in, get a better seed bed, and then level the ground. Okay, so that's about my forty minutes and maybe a little bit extra. Um, if anybody, I do write a newsletter along with John Zettler. And if anybody has stayed this far and is still interested in seeing three or four weeks free, just send me an email. Now this is not, send me an email and I'll add you on the list for two or three or three or four weeks and then you can see the type of thinking and thought process we go through. So with that, I am going to turn it back to the presenters. Thank Did you I? Patrick for that very interesting presentation. Uh, just give us a second and we'll switch the presentations over and next up is Jeff Meyer. Okay, Sarah, you should see something up now. Yeah, just sending it live. Jeff, you should be ready to go. 
Okay, looks like we're all set. Uh, so I'm uh, my name's Jeff Meyer. I'm a IT specialist and uh, GIS slash mapping specialist here at uh, Lower Trend Conservation. I've been doing a lot of work over the last 10 years um, with uh, Sarah and Ann and with the Bay of Quinney Remedial Action Plan. And uh, we've been happy to have Jason on board this year doing some of the, the stewardship work. Um, now I come from a totally different background than uh, than Patrick does. Um, you know, I'm absorbing everything he's saying like a sponge because uh, he's got a lifetime of experience in and everything it sounds like from soil chemistry and the economics optimization and um, soil rotations forages uh, my, my experience comes from a purely mapping background so i'm very um observationally based um, um so we're looking at uh, basically um erosion is is the crux of my um presentation today and um, and I'm hoping you'll find some of this uh, stuff illuminating. I find some of the visualizations we're, we're able to do um, is, is a powerful way of conveying really how the soil is moving around the field. Um, I was originally scheduled to give this presentation uh, around the end of March uh, at Selby Community Center, uh, but that got canceled for obvious reasons, but I'm uh, excited to have the opportunity to share some of this stuff today. So I come from the angle of geographic information systems, digital elevation models, um, commonly referred to as, as GIS and DEMs. So I might throw around those acronyms. I'll try to minimize my use of acronyms today, uh, but sometimes it just comes as a habit. So GIS um, is basically a software to develop and display mapping information. Um, my focus and my training is in uh, terrain analysis, aerial photography, satellite imagery, and LIDAR applications. Um, so let's just move on. My, uh, my presentation will be significantly shorter than, than Patrick's just was. Uh, I want to give Jason the opportunity at the end to, uh, to get into some of the grants and stewardship opportunities available to us. Uh, but uh, I won't rush through things. Um, so. Um, Basically, um, uh, there's two main sources of terrain information where I come from. Uh, there's photo based elevation models. Um, there's LIDAR elevation models. Um, there's also other sources like ground based laser scans or on the ground surveying. But with all these different techniques, um, and with the newer technologies, some of the ideas that we're able to start to measure actual changes in surface elevation on the fields. Um, so the two main sources I'll be using today are these photo based from aircraft and, and, and LIDAR from aircraft. The way the aircraft photos work is just, uh, you basically have um, overlapping air photos, it's called stereo photography, and that allows you using some software to try to kind of get some relative elevation changes on the field. Uh, the other source, like I mentioned, is uh, is is laser based or or lidar. Lidar meaning uh, light detection and ranging, just like radar uses radio waves. Lidar is using uh, light. Uh, it's usually a, a green laser um, shot down from the instrument, and and it's measuring the uh, the time to get back to the sensor. Uh, I have less experience with uh, with drones and ground based laser scans, but I have seen some some papers recently where they're trying to use drones um, to garner this type of information. So with any type of source data you're looking at, um, you're going to wind up with, uh, with a 3D point cloud. So this is some of our real data. Uh, this was a photo based elevation model. Actually, this was for work we were doing on the Lake Ontario shoreline with the Conservation Authority. Uh, we were trying to measure um, where the where the Lake Ontario shoreline was was eroding more rapidly than others in order for uh, for the regulations and all that. So this uh, this is sort of the raw data you might get from uh, from some of these sensors. Um, this particular uh, data set um, um, you can see kind of in the data at the bottom there. It had uh, five points per square meter, which is a 
you know, pretty high density uh, measurements, and uh, we found them to be uh, fairly accurate. Um, so from the raw data, we process it into um, into a terrain model or a digital elevation model, uh, which is uh, which is a gridded product, which allows you to uh, do some more advanced spatial analysis with it. Um, um, hydrological applications, uh, change detection, floor accumulations, um, gully modeling, all kinds of cool stuff um, you can do with these gridded products. I wanted to mention um, that the province of Ontario actually is making a lot of uh, their LIDAR data free and open uh, to anyone. Um, and if you reach out to me, I can provide my email address or my phone number at the end here, and um, and, I, and you'll see the URL actually on the um, on the screen there. And um, but if you just sort of Google Ontario Open Data Elevation Data Sets, you can get access to a lot of the stuff they're publishing, um, and you're free to use it. Um, bear in mind, you know, they're super heavy duty data sets. Um, you may or may not need specialized software to work with it. Um, but there is um, there is some open source free GIS applications. Um, one of the big ones is QGIS. Here at work, I uh, use uh, ArcGIS, but um, the, the province and, um, and ourselves are trying to, there's an effort out there to make a lot of this uh, information um, easier to access uh, for folks and uh, with the internet now uh, it's getting a lot easier to, to share this stuff. Um, so this started about five years ago uh, some of our initial looks at this I, I did the rounds uh, around that time it would have been around 2015 early 2015 um, myself and and, uh, and Sean that the technical specialist here looked at trying to use some of this terrain information to model where the kind of the biggest gully locations are at. Um, and we had a bit of success with that. We, um, we supplied maps to a number of farmers who took up uh, the soil testing and cover crop grants with the stewardship staff here. And I think it was a good partnership to kind of paint a full picture where they're, they're starting to see where their fields are eroding and they're combining that with their soil test information and it starts to tell a pretty powerful picture of uh, change going on on their fields. Just in a nutshell, behind the scenes, this is kind of some of the uh, the modeling that happens. Um, we call it uh, stream power index, which is just basically a measure of uh, concentrated water flow that may form into gullies. Um, the erosive power of your gullies is a function of not only the slope, but actually also the upstream uh, catchment area. So larger catchments are going to accumulate more water and have more erosive power as they flow downhill. So just a quick um, example here of some of what that looks like. You know, to, a, to, to yourselves or a farmer on the field, you know where your gullies are, but this allows us to look at it in a more regional context um, and it becomes pretty apparent that uh, you know gully sites are maybe originating off the field or well upslope on the landscape and uh, you know all your fields and your neighbors are connected one way or the other hydrologically and we've got uh, we've got that study published uh, for free up on uh, ResearchGate. again I can provide links to any of this stuff um, at the end so what I'm uh, what I'm interested in talking about today briefly is is observational methods um, to try to get to to be able to quantify the, the amount of soil coming off the fields um, with the gullies. It's great. We can see where the gully lines are, but we can't actually quantify, you know, how many tons per acre per year are really coming off the field. Um, so my object with this uh, newer kind of research is to see if we can compare LIDAR and photo-based DEMs over time and, uh, and, and can we actually see any visible elevation changes on the field and it, and it turns out we could. The, um, the classic uh, way of, of estimating the total soil coming off the field would be um, 
using the variations of the universal soil loss equation, um, where um, I'm finding the results to be very accurate with the with these um, with the with the USLE uh, soil loss methods. Um, but what we can do with the lidar now is get a lot higher resolution um, and really see specifically um, where on the field soil is coming off. Uh, you can run, uh, anyone can run on the net uh, through, I think if you Google Ag Maps or Agricultural Information Atlas, omafra has got some tools where you can actually zoom right in on your fields, uh, you know, with some graphic tools, draw the boundaries of your fields, and then it starts to spit out some information if you provide a little bit of information to it, such as, you know, how intensely uh, you're tilling, uh, what kind of crop rotations you have, and then their system will make some rough estimates of uh, annual precipitation intensity and stuff in order to give you a sense of um, what's coming off the field. So this is the modeling approach. This is not my stuff, but I'm 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 comparing a lot of my stuff to the what's available on Ag Maps. And this is one of the demo fields uh, uh, I wanted to compare. And so Ag Maps uh, gave um, about uh, 10 tons per acre on average coming off this field, which is an extremely high rate of erosion. I imagine if you talk to, to Patrick, he would probably uh, um, recommend converting this uh, into another use, but uh, you know, um, all that stuff's arguable. So um, uh, anyway, moving on, uh, just so we're on the same page, I like, I'm a very visual observationally based person. I like to uh, kind of have some visual cues of, of what we're looking at um, and this might be second nature to you folks but this helps me so um, you know uh, roughly one cubic yard of topsoil is one ton so if you're losing five to ton five to ten tons an acre per year off the fields this is a little visualization of, of how much per acre per year is coming off so the, the young lady on the left is uh, is around uh, is standing beside about a five ton uh, pile of topsoil and and the lady on the right is uh, standing beside 10 tons or 10 cubic yards. It's a pretty simple conversion. So what are we talking about here today? We're talking about observational topographic change detection is really what we're talking about and it's just a fancy way of saying you know where is the soil eroding from the fields? Where is the soil depositing on the fields and where is it discharging off the fields. So we basically take a, a LIDAR data set from um, you know roughly 10 years ago and compare it to a more recently acquired one and, we're, and then uh, we, we, we basically it's pretty straightforward actually with a little bit of massaging of the data um, to create a, a so-called um, difference elevation model or a, or a DEM of difference and it'll show areas that are higher than they were in the past and areas that were were lower than they were in the past with the assumption being that erosion is the primary process you know there could be other processes there could have been some fill added to these fields there could be compaction of the fields but I think um, overall it's probably different erosion uh, processes that are that are causing the majority of these changes, um, whether that be tillage erosion or water erosion, wind erosion, all that stuff. So um, with the observational approach, we don't need to make any assumptions about what's causing the erosion. Um, and I'm not the kind of guy who can who can tell you what to do about your erosion or or what's the right, you know, um, what's the right tillage intensity or crop rotations that you'll have to talk to Jason and Patrick about that that kind of stuff but what I can do is supply the observations and the mapping information so uh, here's just a little um, I'll just run through I got about 10 more slides uh, just to illustrate um, a particular demo area we're looking at um, this is in the area around uh, Smithfield um, sort of northeast of Brighton and um, and if this is your particular field, uh, just get in touch with me. <laughs> and uh, but um, highlighted in red, I'll get my laser pointer out here. I think here we go. You should be seeing 
a laser pointer. Uh, so these are the, this is the regional context of these uh, four plots that we're looking at. These plots are, you know, 10 to 15 acres in size. Got Highway 2 and the rail tracks running through there. And this is an air photo from uh, 2018 collected by the province that we partnered on. So now if we strip off uh, all the surface features and we just look at the raw elevation data, uh, this is what the terrain model looks like. And I chose this area because um, just for the sake of example is that it's 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 clearly a, a highly erosive area. Um, we got um, Smithfield Creek draining through here with a with a smaller tributary uh, coming through there. These are, um, you know, this is sort of the escarpment or whatever you want to call it, the former shoreline uh, when the lake levels were significantly higher back in the day. We're talking thousands of years ago, but uh, up here we've got some shoreline sandy deposits um, and down here be a little more kind of clay silt um, kind of thing. So you'll find down here you find the surface uh, drainage density a lot higher. Up here you're not getting as much drainage off the surface, but what you're getting is a lot of deep incisions. So if we zoom in a bit here, here's the same areas. And um, what I'm uh, what I'm noticing, and and maybe this is second nature to to other folks, is that even in the raw air photos, we can pretty clearly see um, where the erosion and deposition areas are. Patrick mentioned um, uh, organic carbon content. Um, and my guess is based on my air photo experience, these lighter areas, are having lower organic carbon or organic matter. And um, these are the areas that, that are eroding. And these, are, these are the areas where you're having reduced yields. And you can even see some of the, the gully formations coming off. And these uh, darker channels here would be depositional areas. So they're holding more moisture, they're holding more or, or organic matter. And, uh, and you see it all across. We see lighter areas up here darker gullies through there. So we go back to the regional model here. Remember this is um, Smithfield Creek coming down there. Here's a small tributary and we look when we look at a sort of a shaded relief model you can see a little bit of the erosive features. If we take it one step further we can put in these uh, these gully lines or the stream power index lines that we were talking about uh, briefly earlier. Um, so these are really the concentrated channels where uh, water and potentially uh, suspended sediments are getting discharged off the field. They're generally, um, you know, for areas with nice drains and ditches, you know, you get kind of a regular pattern. If you are having a little more drainage off the surface, you know, obviously your gullies are going right through the middle of, middle of your fields and, and you're getting a lot of discharges off there. So just the same view of that stuff um, on top of the air photo. Again, you're seeing the gullies running through the center of these fields, but we're also seeing darker colors on the air photos, which is showing we're actually um, having net deposition of soils in here. And then during during storm events, um, theoretically, these are gonna get in, getting washed out. So here's the, uh, at the end of the day, the, the piece de resistance, this is the, uh, the 2009 elevation model difference versus the 2018 elevation model and the um, the oranges into reds are areas that are um, eroding and the 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 darker green areas are actually going to be deposition net deposition um, of soils so over time you know if you think about it whether it be tillage or water erosion or whatever, we're seeing kind of, we're seeing a leveling of the fields, um, which is, uh, you know, you're getting soils from upslope, one way or the other getting pushed down into the valleys where it's, where it's sort of uh, depositing. And then you maybe during storm events or other times a year when the, when the, when the ground's frozen, you might get these discharge uh, flow events um, coming off the field. And we see a lot of variability across the field. So like the, the sort of off the shelf universal soil loss 
equations will give you sort of a net average soil erosion off the field. But when we're actually looking, this is an actual observations of, of surface change over time. There's no modeling or anything to do here. These are just raw observations. The areas in orange and reds here were actually lower down in 2018 than they were in 2009. So they're they're clearly eroding. Um, why they're eroding, I can't really get into, but this is what the observations say. This particular area here, I'm guessing they took out a hedgerow at one time or another. So it does show change there. Um, but as we can see in the, uh, the 2018, there was no such feature, but uh, I didn't have a 2009 photo available <clears throat> in this area. Uh, here's the same field, so we can um, just from an overhead uh, point of view, so we can actually say it might be a little hard to see, but the net erosion overall, um, we see it's about half an inch um, lower overall, averaging the whole surface uh, than it was about um, 10 years ago. Um, but within that, you know, half an inch, 1.2 centimeters lower, there's a lot of variability where some areas the slopes have actually receded back considerably more than the average of the field. So, you know, consider the half an inch as an average. Some areas are, are significantly more um, um, having a having a more significant change over time. And so here's just another uh, uh, similar field uh, just uh, in sort of a 3D perspective, we see the lighter shades, lower organic content, kind of upslope here, and we see the gully discharging out there. I think that's actually a bit of snow. This must have been an early spring uh, photo. So that's a, that's probably a fairly deep gully in, uh, in, a, in shade, and, a, and it's keeping quite cool, and the snow persisted there a little longer. And what we see in the, in the change map of uh, 2009 versus 2018 is significant erosion off this particular slope, and then off the back end of this slope too, uh, going towards this drain. I think um, maybe I can just sort of highlight that ticker just to emphasize that we can see. So that's kind of the edge of the erosive zone on the air photo, and there's sort of the edge of the erosive zone on the elevation model. So these are two totally independent data sources flown at different times and they're revealing the same information. So I think it's taken a lot of the guesswork out of where soils are being lost on the field and perhaps um, targeting um, you know, management practices to those areas through your discussions with Patrick and, and Jason, um, you know, would be the best bang for your buck is what I'm trying to say. So uh, same thing here, let me get rid of those lines. Um, so this is the, the same field just a little later in the spring, probably May, June kind of thing. Uh, it looks like maybe this is a more recent photo. It looks like they might have converted this into some kind of grass or forages by now. I can't say for sure. Um, but uh, again, we see these same patterns of, of lower yields or uh, reduced organic content and, and, and moisture in these areas that are, that are corresponding uh, to these maps here. So I think it's a pretty powerful, to me, it's a pretty powerful way of visualizing and to understand the variability across the field. So just a few closing remarks. Um, my understanding is that judging soil loss can be quite difficult, but maybe some of these new technology tools can assist um, to, uh, to quantify and visualize the distribution of where soils are being lost, where they're being deposited, where your gullies are, um, and maybe where to implement some erosion control, some, you know, um, uh, changing tillage methods perhaps, maybe converting to forages. Um, again, I'll leave that to the experts to, uh, to determine uh, or, or work with you and discuss what the best way of dealing with that stuff is. Um, in this particular area, based on some preliminary data, I'm, I'm thinking average soil loss rate is roughly five tons per acre per year in this area. Um, and that's averaged across the field. And um, some areas um, in the extreme case are up to 10 tons per acre. And that's, um, to me, that's that's money um, getting washed out. Uh, so this, uh, these, um, these weights kind of correspond to half an inch to one inch topsoil loss over 10 years. And uh, 
this is this is right in the range uh, where we're able to detect those elevation changes with these new technologies. And um, and I expect you know if we come back now and you know in another ten years, twenty years, you know it'll be interesting to see um, you know if if we're if if we're still seeing those kinds of rates moving forward. Uh, soil loss across the field is, is quite variable. Some areas may be rapidly eroding while others uh, show deposition in the valleys. Uh, nutrients and organic matter are rapidly lost in highly eroding areas and flushed out the gullies. Um, Multi-year high resolution terrain information provides detail about the variation of erosion across the field. Um, Based on this data, the most highly eroding areas are ridges, knolls, and upper slopes terminating at gully streams. So there needs to be a mechanism to actually um, discharge um, the eroded material, and um, and it'll accelerate the rate of erosion if there's a gully or or a stream nearby. And um, for my kind of really basic analysis, the most cost-effective option. Um, maybe to focus on reducing erosion in those specific uh, targeted areas. And that's about all I had for you today, but I welcome any questions or um, I can provide my email address and I can get you hooked up with uh, some of these resources or if you work with Jason um, um, or other staff, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to try to look at what data we have available for the area and to, and to try to create some visualizations for you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A. If um, anyone has questions for Jeff, please uh, submit them in there, or um, you can also follow up with his email. If you want to follow up later. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we'll now switch over to Jason, who will discuss the uh, stewardship programs and grants available through the Bay of Quinney Remedial Action Plan. Just... There you go, Jason, you should be good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to talk for about eight minutes, uh, just about the Bay of Quinty Remedial Action Plan, as well as some of the uh, stewardship opportunities uh, that you might have as, as landowners. Uh, so my name is Jason Jabai. I'm the Environmental Stewardship Technician uh, here at the Bay Quinty Remedial Action Plan. So really briefly, what is the uh, Remedial Action Plan? Well, it began, began in uh, 1985 when the Bay of Quinty was designated an area of concern by the International Joint Commission under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And then from uh, that identification came the Remedial Action Plan, which aimed to improve the water quality in the Bay of Quinty. As uh, Sarah mentioned earlier, currently the main focus is keeping phosphorus out of the bay, and locally it's delivered by either lower trend conservation or uh, Quinty conservation. So this is the area uh, that we work, so this is the lower portion of the Bay of Quinty uh, watershed. And so this is the, the area where uh, most of the programs that I'm going to talk about uh, are available to you. So the first one, and it's probably the most popular one, is called the Healthy Soils Program. And what that is, is us providing free soil sampling. So uh, you get in contact with us, I go up to your fields, and uh, I sample them using the OMAFRA protocols uh, up to 100 acres. And then we provide you with uh, analysis uh, done by own MAFRA accredited laboratory. And we also provide you with some uh, simple uh, contour mapping. And this is kind of just an example of just a bunch of random uh, fields of sort of the data that you're provided. So you're given uh, phosphorus levels, pH, organic matter levels, that sort of thing, just to, to help you better manage your field because a lot of landowners don't actually know what these uh, levels are in their fields. So they could be wasting uh, money or uh, unsure about what they're actually doing. So this just allows you to be more thoughtful um, and make more informed decisions about soil management uh, on your fields. Uh, the next uh, one, which is quite popular, is the cover crop program. So if you have not tried cover crops before, this is a great uh, program for you. Uh, it's essentially, it's a bit of a rebate program where we provide you with uh, $10 per acre uh, to have cover crops on your fields, so up to 
uh, 100 acres or a thousand dollars of uh, rebate. And um, as Patrick mentioned earlier, we're not going to say you have to use this species or that species. You can use a, a number of mixes or a species of cover crops, whatever works best for your property. And the idea is to primarily give people a chance to try out cover crops um, and have a little bit of a, a financial incentive just to make it a little bit easier on you. Um, and then how that works is you apply to the program, you let me know what you want to put down and how many uh, acres. And uh, if approved, then you just give us a receipt for uh, the, the money that you spent on the cover crops. And once it's growing, you let me know. I go out to the field and say, yep, you planted what you said you were going to plant. And then you get your refund. It's pretty simple. So some other ones are uh, waterway planting. Uh, this one we provide up to a thousand dollars to create uh, permanently vegetated buffers along waterways and wetlands. So this is uh, to help you uh, minimize erosion, but then also keep um, nutrients and soil from going into our waterways. It does have to be native plants, so we don't want you planting, you know, Japanese maple or something. It has to be something from the Ontario area. And there's a minimum of five meters from the shoreline that has to be planted. So the buffer has to be at least uh, five meters wide. Another one is livestock fencing. So we provide up to 70% of the cost of the project, up to $7,500. And as the name implies, it's to keep livestock out of waterways and wetlands. And this can cover fencing materials, uh, permits, contracting, installation fees, uh, all sorts of things. The alternate watering system is similar. 70% of the project up to $7,500 uh, can be rebated. And to be uh, applicable for the alternate watering system program, your livestock must be fenced out of the waterway or the wetlands. So you can actually apply to multiple of these programs. You can apply to the alternate watering system uh, program, but then also apply to the livestock fencing and then combine that with waterway planting as well. So you can keep your livestock out of a wetland um, and then make sure that there's a nice buffer of vegetation and then also install an alternate watering system to make sure that your livestock is still being watered. So there's some great uh, synergy that you can have there. And this can cover all sorts of systems like gravity fed, solar, wind, in-stream pump, all sorts of systems. Even uh, the drilling of a new well, if it's being solely used uh, by the livestock. So the well one is a little bit trickier to get approved for, uh, but it can definitely happen. And then this one is sort of a, a catch-all for a lot of projects that don't fall into those other ones. So we uh, can refund you up to 50%, up to $7,500 for a erosion water quality improvement project. So this is just projects that contribute to reducing erosion or improving water quality in the Bay of Quinte uh, or its, its tributaries. Uh, so it covers all sorts of projects like stream bank stabilization, improving uh, manure storage, barnyard runoff control, erosion control structures, stormwater management, even uh, constructing wetlands. So this covers a lot of different projects that you can do on your property. And then the last one, which is more targeted towards uh, homeowners, but maybe you have a cottage or something in this area. Uh, it's the septic savvy program where we provide uh, free septic pump outs up to $2,500 in this concentrated yellow area here. And after an inspection, if you see that uh, your risers or your baffles need to be repaired, we can uh, help you with up to 80%, up to $400 uh, of that program. So again, this is the area where the majority of those programs uh, are available. Um, it is, of course, limited by the amount of funding. So depending on how many people apply within a certain year, uh, we may or may not be able to, to fund you. It is on a first come, uh, first serve basis. And also uh, what's important is that we would like you to get in contact with us before you start these projects. So don't uh, start a fencing project with the assumption that you're going to be approved because there is uh, an application process for this. So uh, we're at the end of the, uh, the, the presentation here. Uh, we will be sending out uh, a participant survey. It should have been emailed to you, I believe at 2.40. Uh, and uh, it's sent via a Eventbrite. So if you don't see it in your inbox, uh, it might have gone to your junk folder where a lot of emails from Eventbrite go. Uh, if you complete the survey before December 1st, you'll be entered to win 
our little swag bag there with a, a mug, a couple of shirts, a bag, a hat. Um, and it's very easy to complete. It's only 10 questions, mostly multiple choice. It should take you about uh, three minutes. And there's also a section in there where you can say uh, if you want to sign up to the BQ Wrap newsletter. And it's just one email a month and it'll let you know about all these stewardship programs, when things are available. Uh, also, when things like the recording of this webinar will be available. So uh, if you complete the survey, there's a section in there uh, to register for that as well. Uh, alternatively, you can just let us know uh, directly that you're interested in these programs and uh, we'll put you on a list and let you know when they're made available again. Um, so at this point, we did want to offer if there's any last minute questions, anything that popped in your mind, uh, you can put it in the Q&A section and uh, any questions for uh, myself or Sarah regarding BQ Wrap or uh, Jeff or Patrick regarding their presentations. This is kind of um, uh, your last chance to ask, ask it live uh, in the Q&A section. There is a, a bit of a delay in that, so uh, please be patient. Uh, otherwise, you can get in contact with any of us uh, about anything that we talked about today, and we will be happy to uh, discuss that with you. So are there uh, any additional questions, Anne, for anybody who presented? I, I'm not seeing any new questions at this time. OK. That's perfectly fine. So you have all of our emails. We want to thank you again for joining us, uh, Sarah, unless you have anything else that you wanted to say to uh, round off the presentation. Um, then I believe that's it. No, I think um, everything was well covered. Excellent presentations from everybody. I would encourage people to um, get hold of any of the presenters. Um, they're more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you for joining our webinar. <laughs>